Brothers and sisters, welcome. For those of you joining us online, we welcome you as well. I just want to say 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And as Peter is preaching in Acts, he says, And there is salvation in no one. He's referring to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given by any man by which we must be saved. We find salvation in Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen? And so we are here to celebrate him, we're here to honor him, and we're here to lift his name up. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. The joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you, lifted on your wings And the world will see that Our God saves Our God saves In the name of the Spirit, Lord, we've come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior. Fall on. Hear the joyful sound. Hear the joyful sound of our offering. As your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings. saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that and the world will see and the world will see that our God said Songs of praise. 
our God says, yes, our God says, our God says, amen. Again, if you're just coming, we want to welcome you into this space to honor the Lord, to lift up his name, to praise him, because it's through him and by him that we are saved and changed. You are who you say you are. You'll do what you say you'll do. You'll be who you've always been to us. Jesus. Our hope is in you alone. Our strength in your mighty name. Our peace in the darkest day remains. Jesus. Yes, we know we will see the enemy run. This we know we will see the victory come. We hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. Our guide through the wilderness, our joy in the heaviness, our way when it seems there is no way. Jesus.
you so much for singing with us, raising your voices to praise the one true name. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Pierce. I'm one of the elders here at Harvest, and I'd just like to welcome everyone and say thank you for joining us in worship today. And if you're a new or recent visitor, we ask you or we're inviting you to text the word welcome to 559-245-6200. We would like to send you just a special uh, introductory thing to, so you would learn a little bit more about Harvest and who we are. So again, if you just text the word welcome to 559-245-6200, we'd like to send you something. And good news, today is the potluck. So we're going to have a potluck today, and now we have a regular place to meet. We're going to start having regular potlucks. Today we're going to have pulled pork sandwiches. If you have not RSVP'd for this event, please stay. We'd love to have you. There's always plenty of food. We'd love to, to visit with you and, and have a meal together. So even if you haven't RSVP'd, we're invited to stay and, and have a great lunch with us. And next, the student harvest. They're going to have a costume party. This is going to be coming up October 29th at 6 p.m. And there's going to be a lot of fun games and food. There's going to be a meal there. And there's going to be a costume contest. So they're looking for a friendly superhero costume competition. So this is a great way for kids. You can be creative. So any questions on that, please RSVP uh, the Guzmans. But before I go to the next announcement, I want to step back to the last one. As far as the potluck's concerned, we love the children at Harvest. We love our kids. But one of the things we want to make sure we don't do is allow the kids into the kitchen here. One of the requirements that we have here is to make sure that they're not running around in there. So please, everyone, be diligent to make sure kids are not in the kitchen. And next is the women of Fresno. The Harvest women of Fresno are going to go on a walk and a brunch. So this is going to be Saturday, November 12th. The women are going to meet at the Fryant in Fort Washington by Starbucks, and they're going to have a walk, and they're going to have a lunch together. Ladies, I'm only going to say this. If it was the men, we're going to park at the restaurant and walk in the door. But, so I admire your, your dedication to stay healthy. Any questions for that, please RSVP Sonia Dosti. And next, the men's Bible study is going to resume. And yesterday, we moved the church office. So... While I'm on that topic, I want to say, thank the men that turned out yesterday. It was a wonderful day. It happened quick. We moved everything from the office, and I think everyone was back home by noon. So it was really a great day, and I want to thank you to all the men that showed up. Worked very hard, very, worked very quick, and we moved everything out of the office, and it's all in storage. So men, thank you for that. So the men's Bible study, we're not sure where it's going to meet at this time, but that will be coming up in the future. But what it's going to be Starting is November 5th at 7.30 a.m., and they're going to go through the Tony Evans book, Kingdom Man. So if you, want to, if you want to be ready to take hold of the biblical anointing and become the sold out for the kingdom of God, if that's who you want to be, come on out and, and see this, uh, join the study men. The books are going to be $10, and if you have any questions for that or if you want to sign up, you can contact Carlos Guzman. And for any of these announcements... That you're, if you're not getting them or you're not seeing, obviously some people are online and some people miss service, we have a weekly email that goes out. If you'd like to be added to that weekly email, you can contact church at harvestfresno.org and they get, put you on that weekly email list. You'll get prayer requests. You'll get a lot of the announcements that come out. And also, if you want to contact, say, Pastor Ben, myself, Nathan, or, or anyone, Brian, anyone else in the, in the church for some reason and you're not sure how, Again, send an email to church at harvestfresno.org, and, and that will make sure that the right stuff gets to the right person. And lastly, before we go to prayer, I want to say on behalf of Nathan and Pastor Ben and myself, the pastor appreciation, gift, pastor appreciation gifts were wonderful. The, the notes from everybody, uh, it was just very, very nice. It was very gracious, very humbling, and we just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. It was greatly appreciated, and we want to let you know that you are loved. And you make us feel loved. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you today, and as Pastor Ben starts a new series, Lord, we just really want to go forward, Lord, and we want to listen to what it is that you have that, for us. Lord, we know you speak through the pastor. We know the Holy Spirit works through him as he studies, and he gets um, saturated in the word. 
And Lord, we also know that as we sit in here, the Holy Spirit takes that word that we hear. And Lord, if we're diligent, if we're like the Bereans, if we study it, we listen to it, and we, if we have questions, we ask the questions. But Lord, we, we get the word in our ear. And then if we read the word as well, Lord, it, it, we get it stored in our heart, Lord. And we know that those times uh, when the word is needed, the Holy Spirit brings it back to us. And also, Lord, the word is is to help us grow and work out our sanctification. So, Lord, as we hear things, as we become aware of things, Lord, we become submissive to your word, Lord. There's there's commands in your word for us, and, Lord, that's what we want to hear. We want to hear what it is that we're supposed to be doing as we work out our sanctification. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, through this study, Lord, we each and every one of us here will grow and become more Christ-like in our walk and in our faith. We thank you, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Good morning, church. It's so good to be here with all of you. And for those that are uh, tuning in online, we want to welcome you as we worship the Lord uh, together. Uh, we are a church that is uh, committed to making disciples who make disciples. That is our mission statement. That is our heart's desire. And so if you are here and want to learn more about that, we'd love to tell you. And so just uh, reach out to me or any one of the elders, and we'd be happy to share with you more about what we do here at Harvest. Let me just say a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, this opportunity. Uh, just thank you for the people that you um, have uh, set aside here at this, uh, in this local expression of, your, of the very body of Christ. And uh, we're so uh, grateful for them. As, as Tom said, uh, um, we, are, we are truly blessed and uh, we are um, grateful for one another. And pray, Lord, that um, your word would go forth today. Uh, we know that your word is unique. It's not like any other. And it can do what we can never do, and that's ultimately change us. And that's our heart's desire is to be changed and conformed into the image of your Son. So I pray that your word would go forth and do this mighty work that we can never do for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. How many out there are Star Trek fans or were Star Trek fans? I'm talking about the original. Oh, look at how many hands. Original, right? William Shatner, Captain Kirk, that one. Yep. Well, many of you know that Captain Kirk went to space. He was part of a crew of Blue Origin, which is uh, Jeff Bezos' um, spaceship, line, whatever you want to call it. And he was uh, 90 years old when he went into space. We have a picture of him and the crew. And he actually <coughs> left the uh, Earth's... Uh, atmosphere and and went up to space in this in this rocket and <clears throat> he wrote about this experience he <clears throat> said that he loved the ministry of the uh, the mystery of the universe you know his mission statement is to boldly go where no man has gone before right so in an attempt to do that there was just this this love for space that he had and um, what was very interesting is he said the experience left him with profound sadness, he wrote in his book. He said that there was no mystery. It wasn't majestic to behold. What he saw out in space was darkness and death. And then he looked in the other direction, and there was earth, which he said was life. He said, life is not out there, it's back there on earth. And I thought that was very interesting. He just described this, this coldness, this darkness, this blackness that is out there. And he said that he had the strongest feelings of grief. For him, the grief was what we're doing with this life that we have. And what I found interesting is that if this life is all that there is, we all should be grieving. It's going to end. But the truth is, there's more. There's a lot more. In fact, the same maker of the earth, of all life, 
is also the maker and giver of spiritual life. And we have to look beyond the physical to see the spiritual. And the thing, what was interesting is while I was reading that article about um, William Shatner, he was talking about these themes of, of the life and death and darkness. And, and those were the themes that we're actually going to be looking at in our prologue as we start a new, um, new sermon series on the book of John. In the prologue, you have those exact same themes. And that's what struck me. And we are going to look at, of course, the maker of life, the giver of life, both physical life and spiritual life, and that person is Jesus. And that's what John writes about. He writes about Jesus. He writes about Jesus as God. And <clears throat> the problem was, he, for many people, is he didn't look like God. He came in the flesh. And when he rode in Jerusalem on, on, the, on the donkey, the, the, the people were saying, who is this person? When he healed the paralytic and he said, your sins are forgiven, and the Pharisees said, who is this person? Only God can forgive sins. Who is this person? We're going to answer that question as we study the book of John, and we're going to answer that question right now as we look in the uh, prologue, the first five verses of the prologue. Let me read them to you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, excuse me, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And from, again, this passage, we're going to look at who is Jesus. The book of John has a special place in my heart, as many of you know from my uh, testimony. Uh, I read the book of uh, John to disprove Christianity to a uh, cellmate who was a skinhead who was going to go out and hurt a lot of people. So I was going to sh show him to be more tolerant. At this stage, I was believed that there were many ways up a spiritual mountain, and I was going to read the book of John to disprove Christianity to him. As I was reading it, I became a Christian, because I was told that Jesus really never claimed to be God, that, in fact, the Bible never really called him God, but then I was reading John, and he's called God, and the deity of Christ is just explodes off the pages of the book of John. And so, John has been a blessing uh, to people for many, many generations. In fact, the whole purpose statement of John can be found in John chapter 20, verse 31, where the apostle John writes, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing that you may have life in his name. So that is the purpose statement for the entire book of John. And also, now our sermon series is called Believe and Live. And now you can see why it is um, entitled that way. Uh, all the gospel, this is one of the four gospels. Uh, you have uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are called synoptic gospels. They're uh, very similar in, um, in how they portray uh, Jesus, there's little distinctions. We, uh, just, we view these different Gospels kind of as camera lenses, looking at the, the same event from different points of view. And so Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah King. Mark presents him more as a servant. And uh, Luke presents really the humanity of, of Christ. But John is unique it's the most theological of them. It's not chronological. He doesn't go uh, uh, explain uh, Christ's life in a chronological manner like many of the other Gospels do. And he emphasizes the deity of Christ, that Christ is God. And so the purpose, again, it has an evangelistic purpose. And we are studying our uh, small group in, in evangelism, so it all kind of goes uh, together. <clears throat> the book of John was 
uh, one of the later Gospels that were written. Uh, it was believed to be written around 90 AD, which is qu quite late. Um, and <coughs> there's an interesting thing about this. It's one of the earliest, the, the fra there's a fragment of John called the Rylands Fragment, and it was found in Egypt around 125 A.D. It's dated at 125 A.D. So if the book was written in 90 in Asia Minor, and it made its way all the way to Egypt in a few short years, it just shows you how authoritative and meaningful this book was to the early church. And as it was written in Ephesus in Asia Minor, it's believed that there was an incipient form of Gnosticism that was a false teaching that was happening. And Gnosticism, you, you may or may not know, was this, um, they professed themselves to be Christians, but they believed in what's called dualism. They believed that anything physical was evil and anything spiritual was good. So it really didn't matter what you did in your body because it was evil anyways. What only mattered was spiritual, and they had this like really esoteric knowledge that you were super spiritually, super spiritual if you had this knowledge, and if you didn't, you, you just weren't, you weren't really a believer. And <clears throat> so to fight this, it's believed that uh, John wrote, uh, well, he wrote First John, the Epistle John, as directly... Uh, against this heresy, but even it's believed uh, by many scholars that uh, the Gospel of John was written to deal with the heresy because he talks about clearly that Jesus is fully God and fully man to dispel the rumor or the belief by the uh, early Gnostics that Jesus could not have been man. They believe that any appearance of Jesus as a man was a phantom, or in modern vernacular, we would say like a, like a ghost. It wasn't real. And so to combat that and directly deal with that heresy, he writes these books. So we will answer the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And first, it's very clear from the beginning <laughs> statements, he is God. He is the eternal God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So starting out in the beginning reminds us of what? Genesis. In the beginning. In the beginning. The word for beginning is arche, which is the source of, of things. Jesus was already in existence when the heavens and earth were made. He existed from all of eternity. Since before, before creation, He existed. And the Word did not begin at a certain point. It al already was. And the, there's a tense in, <clears throat> in the Greek language for this uh, term for was. It describes a continuing action in the past. It, it just reinforces the preexistence of, of the Word. It was continually in existence in the beginning. And he also, it's interesting that he uses a word uh, in the form to be. There, there's this uh, translation to be and also become. And he didn't use the word became. So in other words, the word didn't become um, God in the beginning. It was God. It was eternally God. And so it's, it's, it's important to realize the, the terms that are being used really is reinforcing the pre-existence of, of, of this word before creation. And we know that this is also something that is uh, reinforced in, in Scripture by Jesus himself in John chapter 17, verse 5. <clears throat> this is known as the high priestly prayer where Jesus is, is praying to uh, God the Father uh, shortly before his crucifixion. And he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So this, again, affirms the preexistence of the word. Now, John uses the term word, and 
it's only until later on in uh, verse 14 that he clearly shows that the word is Christ, and it's unmistakable, but he used the word, word, which is logos, and it's kind of interesting that he uses this word because John is writing to both Jews and Gentiles, or, or Greeks, and using this word logos has a particular meaning and would have been interpreted by a Greek one way and by a, a, his Hebrew audience in another way. So for the Greeks, logos was the rational principle of life. It, it was used by uh, philosophers to de- describe this, um, this principle that guided all life. And <clears throat> for uh, the Hebrews, for the Jews... It was more like the word, logos, was the authoritative word. It it, it was always considered, when used in that context, it's it's the word of God. In Psalm 33, 6, it says, By the word the Lord uh, was the heavens made, but by the word, by the logos. So there's this idea that um, the word was something that was spoken, but there was a deed associated to, to it. That if, it, if God speaks, then something is done. In Isaiah 55, 1, it says, So that my word goes out of my mouth, it will not return empty, but it will accomplish what I desire. That's the word. That's the logos. And remember, in, back in Genesis, what did, how did the world Come into existence. And God what? Said, let there be light. And God said, let there be an expanse. And God said, let there be waters under heavens that it gathered. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, logos, logos, logos. So that was how the, the Jewish audience interpreted that as the authoritative word. The Greeks, the rational principle that guided all life. And so it's kind of a a brilliant use of the term so that it had an impact on both the Greek and and the Jewish audience. But there's also something that we see here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Well, the Word was God, but the Word was with God. How does, what is that? How do, how do you make sense out of that? Well, he's describing the Trinity, the, or the beginning part of the Trinity, that the Word was a second person of the Holy Trinity. Not only did the Word exist in the beginning, but it existed in the closest possible relationship with the Father. And so this idea that the Word was with God is an affirmation that, that the Word is separate from God the Father, yet God himself. So this idea of Christ being with the Father, the, the word with is it really um, is, shows more intimacy than what's described there. It's kind of uh, better to consider it face-to-face. The word was face-to-face with the Father. Same essence, the Father, fully God, yet distinct from the Father. And then he says the Word makes no no mistake about it, was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, okay, and the Word was God. It was God Himself from all eternity. It was fully God. It was, in the, in the Greek, it's actually, <clears throat> and God was the Word. You, you, can't, you can't fool around with this, but who does? Jehovah Witness. Translate this, and the Word was a God. Some people say that the, the Word was God, was meaning that the Word was divine. The, 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 the Word uh, sprung from divinity. But that's not what it's saying. And in fact, there isn't, 
they include an article which is not in the text, and yet they don't put that article in other places where the exact same language is, is used similarly in other parts of, of John. And uh, later on in verse 6 and 12, <coughs> it talks about, um, uses the word theos for, for God without an article, but they don't insert an article uh, in those places, so it's totally inconsistent to put it in that place where the word was a God. It doesn't exist. It shouldn't be there. He's saying that the word was God, fully God. And we know that with Jesus, that in, with him dwells all wisdom, glory, power, holiness. Everything that God has, every essence, every attribute exists with Christ himself. And so <clears throat> what's interesting is that as a man, people didn't know that. Yes, he performed miracles that only God could do. He, he, he forgave sinners so only God could do. But even his closest disciples, in, in John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, Philip said to him, Lord, show us your father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, have you been with me so long that you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen, the, uh, whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the Father? So what is then the significance of Jesus, or the, excuse me, the word being, or the Jesus being the eternal, uh, being eternal God? How, how does that, uh, okay, Jesus is God. Well, what does that mean for me today? How, how does that have an impact on, on my life today. Well, the fact that he's preexistent and was with, with the Father. Why don't you think about this? The Father sent Jesus into the world to do what? To die. Now, what father here would send his own child to die for someone. No one, right? No one would do that. No father would do that. No mother would do that. How long have you known your children? How well do you know your child? We have <laughs> known our children for a few number of years we know them on a superficial level compared to the level that Jesus knows the Father. There's an eternity from all eternity. All he's ever known is this perfect relationship between God and the Father, this perfect love that they've had for all of eternity, and he sends his son. If that doesn't do anything for you today, realizing the love and the sacrifice that, G that God the Father made of his son today for you, then you don't know the Word was God. You don't know the Son. It gives you a greater appreciation for the sacrifice that Christ made for us today in our lives. And who should we be living for? Which comes down to, this, to the second idea of what, what the relevancy today for us is the Logos. What's your, rat, what's your guiding principle in life? What do you get up in the morning for? For some, <laughs> your, your guiding principle of life is, well, I just want to be a good dad. I want to provide for my family. I want, my, my goal is just, I want to be a good mother. Well, that's good. But that shouldn't be your guiding principle for life. You see, that's part of the Logos. The Logos says, you know, you should be, that parents should have, uh, you know, be responsible parents and raise their children up in a certain way. That's one small aspect of Logos. That shouldn't be your guiding principle for life. What you get up for in the morning. It shouldn't be your job. 
It shouldn't be any other relationship. It's the Word of God. It's Jesus. He's our guiding principle. What He says should captivate us and engulf us to the point where we wake up and we live for Him. Is He your logos? That brings us to another aspect. Who is Jesus? He's eternal God. He's also the creator. Look at verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So here we have the obvious connection between the word, logos, and creation. In fact, the, the Greek here is emphatic. It says not even one thing came into being that was made apart from the logos. And so we know, if you've been in this uh, church for a while, you know that we have taught this. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, it makes it very clear that Jesus is the creator. It says, For by him, speaking of Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. So here we see that Jesus is the creator of not just the physical world, the invisible as well as the visible, authorities and rulers and dominions. So the angelic world, the spiritual world, he created the spiritual world as well as the physical world. And notice that it says that all things were not made by him, but through him. In verse 3 it says, and through him. In, uh, in Colossians it said, all things were created through him and for him. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, it shows that the Trinity was part of creation. If we look and we see that the Father was involved and the Holy Spirit was involved also. But the world was made through Christ. He is the one who spoke the world into existence. Let there be light. That was Christ's voice that was, that was heard. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, we have uh, verses 1 and 2, we have a clear understanding of this. Long ago, in many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So the Father made Christ heir, and the Father used Christ to create the world. He was the agent by which the entire world, visible and invisible, was made. He made the world through Christ. God the Father was intimately involved in this. He was the architect, and he made the world through Christ. But we all can, also can see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, <clears throat> yet for us there is one, uh, one excuse me, um, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it said that the Holy Spirit was involved in creation, that it hovered over the waters. And this idea of hovering over the waters, that's not just like this peaceful hovering. No, the, the word for, for the hovering it's, uh, in the Hebrew, it's intensive. It was stirring up and kicking up the waters. It was, the, the, again, an, an active agent in, in creation. And it's all God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Yet there is one God, one Father, from whom all things um, are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, again, through whom all things and through uh, whom we exist. Through. What does creation reveal about God? Well, creation reveals a lot about God. The psalmist talks about that. The handiwork of, reveals the, the handiwork of God. Reveals who he is. Paul talks about in, in Romans, 
For since creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, eternal power, and divine nature have clearly been uh, seen and been understood as what was made so that men are without excuse. We could see character, the characteristics of God in creation. What does it show? His intelligence. <laughs> that he's rational. Uh, there's, there's logic. It shows his power. It, it, think about this. The sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. Right? It takes, at the speed of light, about eight and three quarters minutes for the sun's rays to hit the earth at the speed of light, eight and a half minutes. The observable galaxy you can see there is 93 billion light years. The sun is 93 million miles. It takes eight minutes. At the speed of light, 93 billion light years all around is the observable universe. And yet, God created all of those things and sustains all those things in Colossians. He sustains everything. One million Earths can fit into the sun. We talk about the weather all the time. The earth can burp a, a solar flare the size of the earth, and it could come straight at us. Wipe us out. It doesn't. Why? Because of, the, because of the sun burps. The sun says, say excuse me, and puts his hand in front of it. He guides it. He holds everything together. We're not going to get destroyed by a solar flare. That's not how the earth ends. We are told how the earth ends. He's been very clear. He has everything in order. You think about the, the body, how intricate the body is. The eyes processing color and ears, sound and the taste buds and the digestive system that you could eat something, absorb all the protein and the nutrients and eliminate the rest. And if you think about the reproductive system and the nervous system and how the brain works, who could do that? I, I, I tell unbelievers, code it. Code it. Tr try to code life. See how far you get. And, t and tell me that there isn't someone who's intelligent who is actually doing the coding. There's this idea, they call this the, the, the idea of the watchmaker and the watch, right? If you see a watch lying on the ground, you can assume that there's a watchmaker, someone who made the watch. Well, look at all the creation, and you can see that there is a designer. And the fact that we have air to breathe and, and warmth and food to eat, we, we know a lot about this designer. He cares about his creation. He loves his creation. He provides us uh, delicious food, ice cream. How great is God? <laughs> right? All these things to, for us because God loves us. And that's what you can see in his creation. So again, it's not just the fact that he's a creator, but what does that tell us today about him? Uh, what is that? Okay, so Christ, the Logos is the creator. Now what? Well, he's the author. He designed you. He knows what's best for you. He's the inventor of you. He knows how you work. He knows how you should function. 
He knows what you should do. He knows what you should live for. He knows what's good for you. He knows what's bad for you. We should trust him. He's our designer. Tim Keller gave a great example. A bunch of students were uh, reading this, uh, this poem. And they had all these different interpretations of what this poem meant, what this, what this stanza meant. It could be interpreted all these different ways. And so, what, what's right? They have these different opinions. But if the author of that poem walked in that room and you asked him what he meant, it'd be definitive. Right? We have that. The author gave us the word. It's definitive. It's authoritative. We don't have to guess. We, for us, we want to be the author of our lives, do we not? We want to determine what's right, what's wrong. We want to determine what's good for us, what's not good for us. That's not how it works. You didn't create yourself. You didn't create the world. You didn't create the observable universe of 93 billion light years. The Logos did. Christ did. And we need to listen to the author. And that takes us to the third thing about Christ. He is the, of course, he is God. He is the eternal God. He is the creator. But he's also the source of life. He's also the source of life. Verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. So, John tells us that this logos in him is, the, is life. Life itself. But the life and light are common themes in this, in this book. Even in this prologue. You see that all, all over the place. But here, there's a very clear description of the Logos being the source of life. In him was life. And the life was the light of man. And again, Jesus himself said this in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and what? The life. The life. No one can come to the Father except through me. He is a source. He's the only way to have life. In John 10, 10, it says that the thief came to steal and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He came to give life. He is the source of life. But what life are we talking about? Physical? Spiritual? Well, both. He, we just talked about that he's the creator, right, of both physical and the spiritual. But I think what's the emphasis here is the spiritual life that he's referring to. Why is that important? Why is it important that Jesus is the giver of spiritual life? Why would we need that? Because we're spiritually dead. We're born spiritually dead. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul made it very clear that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We have no spiritual life. We are born spiritual corpses. But it doesn't seem that way. But it's true. There's a story of a, of a farmer and who had his son, and they were going to have chicken tonight, at that night. So he tells the, the boy to, to get a, a chicken, and he says, you know what to do. So the boy had seen his dad enough times to see what happened, so he cut the chicken's head off. But the chicken kept running running in the barn. And, and the son said, the chicken's dead, but he doesn't know it. And that's how it is with us when we're born. We have life, we move, but we're spiritually dead. We just don't know it. We need that spiritual life. And the only way to get it is through Christ. There's nothing we can do to get it. 
th- there's, there's no other source of life. We can't gain it ourselves. We can't learn enough, educate ourselves enough to gain that life. We can't do enough good things to gain that life. It must be given to us by the only one who has it. In John chapter 6, verse uh, 51, Jesus says, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. I am the living, um, as the living Father sent me, I live because of Father. So whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. We live of Christ. Finding the bread of life. That satisfies the, the hunger of our souls, uh, Drinking the water of life to satisfy the thirst of our souls. This is how we get eternal life when we rely on Christ. Trust in Christ, the source of our life. It also says that he is the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. What does that mean? Well, light does what? It illuminates it gives understanding of the mind. But before Christ came into the world, there really wasn't this understanding of, of what darkness truly was. There was this idea of who God was and an idea to, to obey God. But we didn't know God the, the way that we know God until He came into this world. He revealed and reveals God to us. He is the light of the world to us because He has revealed who God is. We would not have known about the the mercy, the grace, the love, the sacrifice of, of God unless there was Christ. The compassion, the tenderness, all of those things were put on display and then ultimately the love of God as he sacrificed his very own son, would not have been known apart from that. So the light is con- contrasted to the darkness. Light refers to truth, darkness a lie, falsehood. Lightness, uh, light refers to moral goodness and holiness, darkness, evil, and sin. Satan's kingdom is the domain of darkness, but Jesus is the kingdom of light and life. So John is telling us that this light shines and overcomes darkness. This this light, the word that is used for the light shining, is it continually shines. It never stops shining. It's not that it shined at one time when Christ came into this world and stopped shining. It continually shines. And it continually overcomes darkness. If you are in a dark cave and you light a match, the darkness is dispelled by that light. And some people have a translation and the uh, darkness did not uh, understand it. That's not the right translation. It's overcome. The only other time this word is used in the entire Bible is in John chapter 12, verse 35, where it says, uh, walk while you have light, lest darkness overtake you. So it would not make any sense for it to be read, misunderstood, or um, did not un- comprehend. So John is saying that darkness cannot defeat the light. The light that Christ gives is the light that gives life. It's the truth of who he is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, in, the ca- in their case, the God of this world, meaning Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So he's saying that, Unbelievers don't realize it, but Satan has caused them to be blind. They can't see the light of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, the truth of who God is. They can't see the life that exists in Christ. 
But verse 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in the hearts to give the light of knowledge and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Despite the darkness of this world, the kingdom of darkness, God radiates his light and his life through the gospel, which is the power of God into salvation. And then Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, that you are the light of the world. It's that light that dispels darkness, and now you are that light, and now we are given the mission to be the light of Christ to a darkened world. That is our purpose. The author has spoken. The Logos has told us what to do. We are to be that light that shines in darkness, that reveals the truth about who Christ is, that he is the giver of life, the only way for salvation, believing that he that he died for our sins and he rose again on the third day and he sent it to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. When you put your faith and trust in him, you have eternal life. That is the message that he's given us. That is the light of the world. Today we're having communion. And this is celebrating who Jesus is. This is celebrating Jesus as eternal God. This is a celebration of Jesus as a creator. This is a celebration of Jesus as the source of life. And we're remembering this. That's what communion is all about. It's remembering that he is the source of life for us. And he made this sacrifice. In eternity past, the plan for salvation was hatched, and you are living expressions of that, thinking about that sacrifice of sending his son, whom he loved from all eternity into this world, thinking about the obstacles, the barriers between us and God because we've been the author of our own lives writing the script instead of following God's script. There's a chance to just bring that before the Lord. Confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Made white as snow. No barriers. No obstacles between us and God and then us and each, with each other. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take bread. <clears throat> in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Son of God was 
Well, thank you for worshiping with us this morning, and um, if uh, you have not put your faith and trust in, in this resurrected King, then we would love to tell you how you can, and um, also uh, know that we, again, as Tom said, we are having a uh, fellowship uh, lunch, and uh, you are all invited. Everyone uh, can come. If you're new here, we would love to have you, and uh, so let me just say a prayer for that right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather uh, to um, exalt your Son, and um, we pray that that was done today, and uh, Lord, um, that is our heart's desire, and that is our um, principle of life, is, is for your Son to be exalted. And I pray, Lord, and just want to thank you for um, this time together with brothers and sisters, but also, Lord, we want to thank you for, for providing everything that we would need. And Lord, I pray that you bless our time of fellowship, that you would use all of us to bless and encourage one another, and thank you for the abundance that you provide for us and the, and the food for our body. In Jesus' name we pray this, amen. Thank you. You are loved. <laughs> 